Welcome to the SAB's March Educational Webinar, Disposable Bronchoscopes, Functionality and Innovation Today and for the Future, part of the SAB's monthly educational webinar series. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. You all have joined in the listen-only mode. Please ask questions throughout this webinar by using the question feature, which is located on your control panel. We will address them during and after the lecture. Any we do not get to will be answered by email. Dr. Gustavo Cumbonicelli is our SAB Vice President, and he will be our moderator this evening. Dr. Kumbo is an interventional pulmonologist. Dr. Kumbo? Welcome, everybody. It's exciting to be here again and um, reinitiate and reignite uh, this series of uh, webinars. We are um, very, very excited about ongoing projects at the SAB. We have uh, our virtual conference coming up this year. We will be releasing very soon the next date for the next exciting webinars. We really want to thank all our commercial um, partners and all our members for helping us continue growing and facilitating these educational resources. It is my true pleasure to introduce a friend, Dr. Singh Jaspal. He is the elected SAB treasurer and his colleague, Dr. Sahar Mansoor. They're both pulmonary and critical care physicians at HM Health, and they're part of the Living Cancer Centers. We're gonna give the podium to both of them. They're gonna uh, enlighten us on disposable scopes and many other things. Welcome both of you and thank you. Thanks Gus for that very nice introduction. Uh, welcome this evening, everybody. I'm Jaspal Singh. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician at Atrium Health and in Charlotte, North Carolina and in Levine Cancer Institute. With me is Dr. Sahar Mansoor. Sahar, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hey everyone. I'm Sahar Mansoor. I'm pulmonary and critical care at Atrium Health Cabarrus. I'm also advanced bronchoscopist. Fantastic, just a quick, quick housekeeping. Uh, I do some financial disclosures and a physician advisory board for some of our sleep solutions and on, and our institutes going through a, a Levine Cancer Institute TOPS program with AstraZeneca. Um, neither of us receive royalties for today's um, topic, however. We will share some proprietary product features, a little bit of an overview, um, trying to avoid becoming a commercial, but more to sort of highlight some of the product features. Um, we will, I will tell you that both, that at least I work, and I'll ask, I'll ask Sahar where she works, but I work at uh, a big medical center, over a thousand beds. Um, but um, I also sort of work in the in different types of ICUs, work in the pulmonary floors. I work a lot in the bronchoscopy suite, doing several several hundred advanced bronchoscopies a year. Um, so I'm, what I'm thinking, and as well as some cases in the operating room. So when I'm thinking about this topic of bronchoscopy, I'm kind of thinking about multiple sites amidst a large health system. Uh, Sahar, uh, how about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I um, work at Atrium Health, uh, the second, uh, actually the second largest campus for Atrium Health. So I work at Cabarrus um, and basically work in pulmonary and critical care also. So we, uh, similar to Jespa, perform bronchoscopies and work in the ICU. So we both have uh, this unique perspective of looking at bronchoscopies in the ICU, but also in pulmonary setting. Yeah, I think it's relevant to frame today's sort of topic about this idea of uh, of, 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 of single-use bronch bronchoscopes. So today we're gonna to to provide an overview of the rationale for single-use bronchoscopes, highlight some key issues surrounding their use, and provide some insight of the potential utilities. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't think I really understood a lot of the utilities until this last year, and I'm still learning more and more. So we'll kind of see where, where we are, as a, hopefully as a community of, of pulmonary critical care physicians. So let's start with a case. Sahar, you wanna start with this one? Yeah, absolutely. So um, basically, let's assume an 89-year-old uh, patient with severe COPD uh, came, comes to your ICU in respiratory distress. You go ahead and proceed with intubation. You get an x-ray. Yesterday was clear, but now it shows right lung atelectasis. So naturally, you want to see if there's a mucus plug you can take out um, or something else going on. Um, so you ask for the bronchoscopy card. Yeah, so basically um, the discussion is what will you get? So um, your options could be, um, go ahead. Yeah, so conventional uh, reusable bronchoscope. So with the bronch tower that it comes with, it could be compact or pretty big. Uh, that could be your option one. Uh, the second option could be um, a disposable bronchoscope, a single use disposable bronchoscope. Um, I remember the first time that got handed to me, uh, luckily I had in service, but I hadn't thought about that in the ICU. Um, and when I 
picked it up, I was like, is this a toy? Like, what am I supposed to do with this? This is, you know, conventional bronchoscopes are pretty heavy and the single use bronchoscopes are pretty light. Uh, seems like a toy also. Uh, but yeah, uh, so we'll go into that into detail. Honestly, I, I, I mean, over the years, as in where I've worked, actually, we've been trying all different types of bronchoscopes. And I first time I got handed this, I thought it was a joke. And I actually thought it was made by Fisher Price or something. And I was like, what are we doing? What is this thing in my hand? It doesn't even feel natural, feels kind of childish, like you said. And I was just shocked at, at sort of like, uh, of like the use of this, that I was being asked to do this. But that was a while ago. And I think a lot's changed since then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the key points we're going to keep mentioning is um, uh, it's a single use, so the disposal bronchoscope. It comes in a bag and sterile scope, um, and so you don't have to sterilize it. And the number of people you need in the room is pretty minimal than what you're used to. So there, I would suggest there are two main um, single use bronchoscopes that at least I have uh, used. Uh, so one is on the left side of the screen, which is from AMBU, um, is single-use bronchoscope, and the right side of the screen um, is what I call light scope uh, from, you know, single-use bronchoscope, but that's from Verathon. Um, so if you look on the left side, um, it's pretty similar to the scope, and I'm even doing that in my hand because <laughs> I'm used to scoping. It's pretty similar to the conventional bronchoscope we have. Um, on the top, you'll see, uh, Jasper, do you mind pointing out the suction where that would attach um, for the endoscope, yeah, right there. And then, of course, you have the lever to move up and down, and then you have um, the catheter on the bottom. And if you look at the glide scope, uh, the flash, just to give you orientation, the suction is exactly where Jasper is pointing at. It actually points at a 90 degree angle. So that's where the suction attaches. Um, and then to actually in insert any medications, uh, you kind of have to do it on the top, and then you have a working channel right there also. Um, so pretty compatible and um, we actually have both that I've used um, in our ICO. Um, so some history behind uh, the development of uh, disposable bronchoscopes uh, really started with um, airway management. So if you think about it, we used to have um, you know reusable um, blades for intubation, uh, but as time has evolved, now we have single-use blades for intubation, and we even have, uh, you know, GoPros that we call, so basically we take the scope with us and go and intubate even on the floor. So that was a really, um, if you think about evolution, started with airway management and made its way into the bronchoscopes. So the first company that came out with a disposable bronchoscope was Ambuscope. Um, so when I looked at this history, it was pretty interesting. It was first released in Europe in 2009 um, and had a certification. I was able to find the country was Denmark. Um, I don't know why this picture is black and white because 2009, 2010, it's not black and white, but it looks pretty cool. Um, but yeah, they pretty much show the scope. Um, and it was first really made for, as it says, video scope for uh, tracheal intubations. Um, so that's why when you look at it, it doesn't have a suction channel because you're supposed to use it for intubations, uh, essentially. So about, um, if you guys, about uh, initial uses were intubations that it made its way into percutaneous tracheostomies. There was quite a bit of literature on that, um, people using it pretty successfully. This is one had done. Um, and then really around 2015, I started seeing FDA approvals for, uh, let's try to use this in actually, not just intubations, but something more uh, meaningful like bronchial lavage and bronchial washing. So 2015 onwards, is when it's bringing its way into um, bronchoscopies. And that kind of brings us to today. And so to understand single-use bronchoscopy, even before the pandemic, um, and I think the pandemic will come as a theme that I think has changed a lot of how we uh, look at things and how we approach things. Um, Got to think of sort of like, what am I using a bronchoscope for? And I and um, it's funny when I ask this co the same co the same topic from bronchoscopists or pulmonologists or critical care physicians, and you start thinking about emergency medicine physicians or difficult airways experts, um, you look look at it differently. Laryngoscopists like ENT physicians might look at this differently. But I'm thinking about sort of solve looking at this approach of my clinical needs. What problems am I solving? 
what are my physical resources I have available at my at hand? Do I have the expertise at hand to do a proper bronchos bronchoscopy to solve my clinical problems? And thinking of not just about equipment, but also cleaning and the next case. And when we think about the pandemic that um, that's still going on, uh, despite what some people seem to think, uh, it's still going on uh, for many of us. And um, and how many you might need multiple scopes at once and, and uh, thinking about that aspect. And then the human resource factor, um, just sort of how much do you want to be the one troubleshooting the scope and everything else like that? And what kind of, what does your team look like? And at the bottom sort of left is the sort of administration piece. And I think a lot of times we get, as physicians, we sometimes feel a little bit like administration is making decisions, but it's incumbent upon us to at least think about some of the challenges administratively and including some of the market trends, which I found very interesting and fascinating in this whole topic as we kind of frame the problem. And then sort of, to go in a little bit further, more specifically, what are the clinical problems at the point of procedure? Is it just simply a diagnostic, like an airway inspection or a lavage of some sort? Or is this something, are you thinking about an array, an array of diagnostic maneuvers from advanced bronchoscopists, you know, so use of ultrasound, whether it be, uh, and it's not available, um, at least for, rate, for disposable bronchoscopes, they're not currently available for linear ultrasound, but think about radio probe um, and uh, other guidance systems, you, start, you, you may find a role here. And then biopsy options and start thinking about what you're going to be doing. And then therapeutic ones, such as advanced airway management, per, uh, PDT for, um, uh, sorry, uh, um, for, for tracheostomy. Um, I can remember sometimes where I actually was a trainee learning tracheostomy way back when. And I remember sometimes like the needle would come in, probably come either dangerously close, and I won't go officially on record saying I damaged a scope, but I'm pretty sure I probably heard a couple of scopes along the way, along with my colleagues as well, having done that. And start thinking about, you know, what that, damage scope feels like or what that what that incurs on in the in terms of resources. Um, suctioning aspects. Uh, you may just do a suctioning bronchoscopy. You may be doing ablation procedures where the scope can get damaged as you kind of do these things and start thinking about can you solve that therapeutic problem with a with a disposable bronchoscope and potentially even save a lot of resources downstream. And then start thinking about, you know, during planned diagnostic procedures, you may have a hemorrhage of some sort or the scope that you're using for a, like, a, like a very small scope you may be using for diagnostic procedure. Now you have a big hemorrhage now or some other complication. You may, want, you may want to change your tools and you may not have what you need readily available. And then now as we get into more, more, more other, other therapies, dilations, valves, stents, whether it be insertion or even extraction, uh, what does that do to your equipment? And then, of course, other things like thermoplasty, the, some other procedures that are coming on the pipeline. You start thinking about in, endoscopy in general and the role of bronchoscopy, and it's expansive. And it's going to con continue to expand as this field expands. So then you start thinking about putting that in the frame of all your context. And then meanwhile, thinking about where the patient is at. It's one thing not all of us have. I do a lot of advanced bronchoscopy. I have a decent suite. But I don't have this Cadillac suite that many people on this call may have, for example, that has all the bells and whistles, lots of space, ample personnel. Um, some of us struggle in the day-to-day, -day, or might, at certain times, Monday through Friday, we have a different hospital on the weekends and nights. And start thinking about where am I doing this bronchoscopy? Is it going to be my endoscopy suite? Is it going to be my ICU? Is it going to be the operating room? Is it going to be an emergency department? Or is it going to be some other location? I mean, there's one patient I saw in the long-term acute care recently, or rehab, that I would have liked to just done the bronchoscopy right there rather than coordinate this complex transfer process. So start thinking about the problem and then solving it ideally close to where that patient is. And then so that sets us up for infection issues, which I think is another important aspect to, for the background. And Sahar, you want to talk about this? Oh, is this my slide? Yeah, so please. Yeah. Go ahead. Go, is this my slide? <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, so basically, I'm not you know, about it, but you can go is these infection issues have been growing for a while. So the MMWR in 1999 had three famous clusters that they published. Um, in 1996, they had sort of five cases of MTB in a single healthcare facility tied to a single reusable bronchoscope and unit. And in 1998, there were seven case, cases of Mycobacterium avium felt to be a contaminant also in a single facility. And then in 1998, 18 cases of multi-drug resistant pseudomonas. And I love the editorial here in the MMWR, which back in the day has been such an important contribution from the CDC. Uh, that infectious complications caused by bronchoscopies are rare, by bronchoscopies are rare, but the instances are probably underestimated. And I think subsequent, uh, a plethora of publications, as much as we in the pulmonary community may have denied this or we didn't think that was real, I think it's shown this actually, it's, it's a real concern. And so global reports now, multiple publications, and since you look in the last you know, decade or so, 
tons of FDA reports about contamination. So why would the contamination be such an issue? Well, you have to start thinking about what makes endos uh, what makes bronchoscopy a little bit different than, let's say, airway or even a direct laryngoscopy. Um, we start thinking about all these aspects and the scopes themselves, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about that. So when you have a bron bronchoscope, what happens when you use it? Well, uh, basically, there's got to be pre-cleaning at where you're going to use it. You got to package and transport it to the site. There's got to be a manual cleaning and rinsing procedure and then a high level disinfection, and then you store it again and tr transport it and store it again. And this may seem relatively simple and straightforward for a lot of people, but you start thinking about long scopes that often are difficult to clean. They get a lot of biofilm over time and they kind of, and they kind of aren't as great as they are early on. It's a time consuming process and there's human error. Um, there's people like sort of, there's a manual component to a lot of the manual cleaning and, dis and rinsing that you know, we know that human error can lead to a lot uh, can lead to a lot of variability. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it can be problematic. And um, and so and so this kind of leads to an important publication here that I think Atul Mehta and his uh, and, and uh, Dr. Muscarella published this year. And this was actually published in March. So you start thinking this was published just as COVID started hitting. I thought it was just unbelievably fascinating that the timing of this publication couldn't be any better. Um, this was public, I mean, it was accepted before COVID hit. And Dr. Mehta and his, and his colleague basically go through and highlight some of the huge multi drug resistant bacterial infections across the globe from 2013 to 2014, all the way up to 2018 and 2019 and stuff. And so you start looking through this timeline and start thinking of the different bugs from Klebsiella, from multi drug resistant gram negative rods like Pseudomonas. E. coli, stenotrophomonas, and then you also have MRSA and other infections, and you just, you just start thinking about all the different aspects of what's happening, and it starts to be read like a kind of like a horror film, um, and especially uh, uh, CRE and such, and you start, and they do a great job sort of going into why these issues are there, and just, just in the background, all of us have had over the years all kinds of other outbreaks we've been paying attention to, like Ebola and other viral, and other viral issues. So you start putting that in the context of COVID and you start, start applying these lessons a little bit. And so the aspects of, um, so Dr. Mehta and his colleague basically go through and talk about what are the risk factors. And so you go through the risk factors and you start really breaking down the parts of a bronchoscope and the various cleaning aspects. You start thinking about um, are there, is it a failure to reprocess according to, to the manufacturer's instructions? Well, if you're like me or Sahar, we don't do, we don't have a dedicated Bronx suite with its own cleaning staff. We loop that into the GI suite, endoscopy suite, or if in the OR, that gets put into a centralized process. And you can imagine with all the tools that they have to manage, they may not follow the manufacturer, manufacturer's cleaning instructions to the T. So you have things like suction valves, um, you start thinking about uh, ultrasound cleaning and those things like that. Start thinking about damaged bronchoscope or one that fails a leak test. I mean, those damages are sometimes really hard to figure out at times, as many of you know. And so preaching to the choir here, but these are just hard to find until you're at the point of care or when it might be too late. And then improper maintenance, servicing or repair. We've all taken bronchoscopes that we thought were, um, that, were that had some minor flaws or le failed a leak test. We send it back in, even if it's under warranty, you bring it back and it's just not the same or it needs to go back again. And so there's always an issue here. Um, persistent contamination by an inaccessible biofilm. These scopes are long and it's just hard to get it truly clean despite all your, a lot of your efforts. It's sort of like, you know, that little grind in a, in a dishwasher or something like that. It's just, it's always cleaned, but it's not properly clean until you get in and somebody scrubs it out. And then use of a flawed device. Hopefully in the U.S. we don't really have a lot of issues with flawed devices, but some parts of the world do. And then the attachment of third-party accessories. You get a port or you a ring that gets displaced. Some of the tools that we use are interchangeable, we are told, but they may affect the loosening of the ring. And then, of course, the environment. So I've gone into bronchoscopes where you're trying to think in a nice, sterile, and relatively, relatively, relatively clean environment, and the scope's hanging off the side. It's touching all kinds of other surfaces and such, and those may not also be cleaned. And so these are things that we all deal with. And so what you can get creed, multi-drug resistant organisms, and other things. Through those, through those aspects. And the damage of the scopes that we talked about is hard to find. Above to the right is, a clean, is the leak test that's supposed to be done right, um, pretty rigorously. But you, when you're processing uh, you know, many, many scopes in your cleaning unit, you can imagine where subtle leaks are missed just by the sheer volume. And the cleaning procedures themselves you know, are, are challenging. They're technically difficult. 
And then of course, um, start thinking about the things that we're doing to scopes, like airway management. I think all of us have probably bent a scope. I sometimes have been horrified by seeing scopes banged against the side, the sides of the walls of the airways and the back of the oral pharynx by people who don't do a lot of these. And you can imagine the amount of trauma they might, be, they might encounter from difficult airway issues to per trachs, like I mentioned the needle or the scalpel coming in, you never know what you're dealing with in those messes. Cautery and ablation is an interesting one. I don't do personally do cryo yet, um, but I know a lot of my colleagues who do, and the and the cryo can actually the, the distal end can affect the uh, damage the scope significantly. Um, I do some cautery, and that also uh, there's times I'm like, oh, that came dangerously close to damaging my scope. And then of course now that we're moving a lot of devices, actually we're moving valves and such, and sometimes you give a pretty good tug in there, and some of those scopes potentially can you know can as you tug and do other things like that, you can actually cause some damage. So Dr. Mehta and his team also brought up, I think, a very nice, succinct, um, and a, a nice list of sort of what the FDA is looking at. The FDA is paying attention to this vigorously. JACO is paying attention to this issue vigorously of infection and so the idea of reprocessing and such. And so when they think about, you know, um, a reusable bronchoscope, they got to think, or any scopes in general, they got to think about, is the process correct? What, what, what measures and what requirements should be there? Um, are there true, what are the true infection risks? Are we capturing them? Are, are we active, actively re, um, surveilling our patients for those things? Um, and so all these questions are there. How often should they be surfaced? Should there be an, a standard pro operating procedure for some of these some of these maintenance contracts and such? And so this, a lot of this still to be determined. Um, and so even what supplies should we be used? Should we standardize some of the supplies to clean? Um, a lot of this, this is still being defined by the industry, and um, but it, it gives a lot of concern, especially as the public is also getting wind of all the issues with with the with the cleaning process. All right, Sahar. Yeah. Yes. So then we we looked at um, with all these issues in conventional bron bronchoscope. Um, as I said, the single-use bronchoscopes made their way into bronchoscopy. Um, beyond just intubation and trache tracheostomy um, as to whether or not they can be used for just routine ICU stuff. Um, so this is a, a paper that was published uh, back in 2017. Um, uh, go ahead, you can click through. Um, so this was in uh, Church Care Center um, in Singapore. It was a retrospective chart review um, and 83 single-use uh, bron you know, bronchoscopies were completed versus 24 conventional. Um, so once again, looking at the indication, uh, again, this is still 2015, 2016 kind of time frame. So single-use bronchoscopes are just making their way you know, into our ICUs. So the highest use was, of course, for cutaneous tracheostomy in, um, in uh, neurosurgery ICU, actually. Um, but they are starting to make its way to microbiology evaluation, uh, which I would suggest uh, they would mean BL or washings, airway inspection, hemophysis, intubation. Um, so the outcomes they looked at um, for microbiological microbi yields. So pretty comparable. So whether you use uh, disposal bronchoscopes or conventional, they both had a 70% yield, uh, which, you know, sounds pretty comparable. Uh, the biggest difference really was uh, how long did it take you to identify and say, okay, I'm going to need uh, to perform bronchoscopy and let's go ahead and do that for the single-use bronchoscope, 10 minutes, which sounds pretty actually approachable, similar to what I do in my ICU. Uh, conventional bronchoscope, 66 minutes. Um, and that could be with all the reasons Jasper had already discussed um, between making sure there's a bronchoscope available. You may need to go down and get it from the uh, endoscopy suite. Is it actually available? Is the card available? Is the card the only one? Uh, as far as the cost, um, uh, basically the author said the cost was similar up front, but I like to uh, challenge that and said, could the cost be lower actually in the single use? So if you don't include the cost of all the repairs, the extensive disinfection steps that are needed for the conventional bronchoscope and the support staff that's needed for maintaining um, a reusable bronchoscope. Um, the key differences uh, where it kind of diverges would be um, that the patients who really needed um, to, you know, who had single-use bronchoscope bronchoscopy done but then needed conventional for patients with homophysis, really, that was a key thing. Um, none of them, the patient needed emergent, uh, you know, conversion, but the broncos uh, bronchoscopists really felt they needed the clarity um, that is really comes with the conventional uh, bronchoscopy, essentially. That was a key difference between the two. 
Yeah, so it's, um, and just a, a quick aside, if I, we should have mentioned it earlier in the webinar, but we may open it, but uh, please put um, uh, questions in the chat um, so that our organizers can use it. Uh, and uh, we'll try to answer our questions during the panel, during, during, if the certain questions come through, we may actually answer during, and may not necessarily wait till the end. Uh, we want this to be an open conversation. So then all this happens, right? So all this is kind of build up to COVID-19. And I think the last year is that today's May, March 11th, um, and it doesn't, it's not lost on us that a year ago that the pandemic hit, uh, sorry, the pandemic was declared a, 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 declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization. So at the one year mark, um, I think in the bronchoscopy world, this in this topic actually changed a lot of how we do things. And so back then, um, Honoré and, and her colleagues basically said, well, you know what, the pandemic's coming. There's a lot of viral fear here, obviously, about the risks of contamination, the risk of transmission uh, in bronchoscopy, especially in aerosolizing procedure. We don't want to change scopes around. And we did this for a lot of other things. We did it for ultrasound, technology equipment. We did a whole bunch of things where we basically said, let's try to contain this virus at where it's at. And so bronchoscopes, same thing. And so Honoré and their colleagues said, you know what, let's look at this. Is this going to, going to be our uh, best uh, best option? They found a pretty good BAL volume, comparable cell count yield, and potentially lower side effects that they was what they postulated. Um, but the idea that you can eliminate cross-infection risk across patients was very attractive to their group. And so they pretty much made that pivot right away, and they published since then. And the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy and the American Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology also published some guidelines saying that, you know what, this kind of makes sense around then to basically switch from a, for a routine bronchoscopy. If you're going to do a bronchoscope, if you're going to use a, bron a bronchoscope in a patient with COVID-19, you might as well go to a, reusable, to, sorry, to a disposable bronchoscope as opposed to a conventional reusable device. And I think all of us sort of made that pivot. And I don't know anywhere in the country, in the United States actually, who hadn't really made an intentional switch to that, um, that, that was sustained. And I think most of us kind of did that. And uh, Sahar, what was your thoughts on how, how, that, went, how that went over? Um, absolutely. And um, I was fortunate enough that our ICU was already on track. So in 2019, um, early on, actually, um, our ICU already had uh, the two, the endoscope and the glidescope uh, reusable bronchoscope. So we were already pretty comfortable using it uh, whenever we did bronchoscopies. And of course, in the first few months, everybody was not clear on the PPE guidelines and very scared of doing an aerosolizing procedure. So bronco bronchoscopy was definitely, I felt like on hold, but the more we got to know about it, uh, then you, you know, use it in our uh, ICU pretty quickly. Yeah, and I think, you know, and I, it's, we got used to it pretty quickly as well. And the other thing I'd want to mention, highlight is that also, I mean, this was easy on the respiratory therapists. They've had a really tough year. In our ICU, um, the respiratory therapists are the ones who are responsible for setting up the bronchoscope, the bronchart, and they've already had just an incredibly tough year. And so now this makes things a little bit easier for them, a single operator, they don't need to go run on the cart. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But this was a huge lift for them too as well. And so the question is, how effective is this process? Yeah, absolutely. So um, actually this just got published in Chess about um, two days ago. Um, so Chang et al. published um, their uh, experience at NYU Hospital, which of course we all know New York got hit really hard. Um, so they looked at, um, only from March 13th till April 24th, so I'm sure they have a lot more data. Uh, they looked at patients who were in their ICU intubated because of diagnosis of COVID-19 and had a bronchoscopy performed. Um, so that ended up being, um, go ahead, you can go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, so, um, sorry, what they were looking at really is, uh, first and foremost, patient and provider safety. Um, and as I said, there was a lot of fear around bronchoscopy uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, of course, and really particularly patient safety as in the complication could have with the unique uh, method they use for bronchoscopy. And for provider safety, the key thing was COVID-19 transmission, because all of us were very afraid um, during the bronchoscopy performing in the ICU, how's that gonna go? And uh, as the Jaspal question, should we be using a disposable bronchoscope anyways during the pandemic? And that's what uh, the New York NYU hospital actually used was a disposable endoscope. Um, and with, the, of course, the video monitor that it comes with, um, which made it uh, really easy. So it's a pretty fascinating article how they perform bronchoscopy, uh, which I won't comment on as much, but as far as um, how many number of patients, so we got 33% of the intubated patients underwent bronchoscopies, 
as I said, 241 in total Bronx. From the patient perspective, uh, really no procedural, peri-procedural complications because they use a pretty um, interesting method of um, pre oxygenating the patient and actually only the bronchoscopy was in the room. They would take the patient off the, um, of the uh, ventilator and the bronchoscopy will be the only one in the room. It's not even a respiratory therapist or a nurse in the room because all they had was this ambuscope um, out of the disposable scope. They perform the bronchoscopy quickly, get the results, uh, come right back out, connect the patient back to the vent. And patients already did that pretty well. Uh, so as far as the BL, about 50% of the patients had a BL performed. And again, if it was indicated, that's why they did it. Um, and the positive cultures were about 65% of the patients, which again, is pretty comparable to the Singapore study. Um, so that's how much you know, comparable you were getting in the ICU. And the key highlight for me also was, yes, patients are safe. And the big thing was the providers are, and the, uh, are safe, actually. So no healthcare provider, there's about 10 of them, which is a good number, uh, who were involved in performing this bronchoscopy became positive for COVID-19 with this interesting technique they use. Um, and that is really, really uh, helpful for me to hear because once again, I'm the one who's performing it. And if I can minimize the number of people in the room with me, if the nurse can stand outside, if the respiratory therapist doesn't need to be in the room to set up this huge bronch cart and manage the event that that's really helpful to hear yeah and, and that's a great segue because then we sort of said well let's survey our respiratory therapists because they've had they've had quite the year and so we actually one of our one of our, our lead respiratory therapists tiffany carrington did a great job surveying uh, our respiratory therapists and they said you know what let's look at sort of how we did so we surveyed about she surveyed about 50 of our respiratory therapists this is not published or anything like that obviously but just an informal survey of our of our teams and said you know what did you like about or dislike about the about the uh disposable bronchoscopes and you know one thing they really liked is the easy it was easy to transport easy to store um it didn't have any it was readily available there's no downtime not like you do a sport bronchoscope and the next thing they got to do is there's a someone wants to do a per trach for down the hall and then there's no scope available because it's being cleaned they don't have to worry about that that they like the ease of use, that they didn't have trouble sh have issues with troubleshooting. And if you're like our hospital, we had a lot of turnover in the last year. So people may not have had the time to really understand how to use advanced equipment, much less troubleshoot it. So from that perspective, from a personnel perspective, it was, it was very popular. It was a quick setup. It was a quick cleanup. It wasn't a lot of extra tools and toys and whole carts to wipe down. So they liked that aspect. They didn't like, they weren't so happy with the picture quality at times or the suction quality. Um, the power cord they thought could be a little bit longer on the different scopes that they tried and that the monitor size and the quality of the monitor themselves potentially needed some work. So if they could get better pictures, a uh, little some of them wanted EMR integration, which to be honest with you, a lot of the scopes don't have it in the OR, for example, I'm going through that right now. Um, they wish they had larger monitors and displays and then maybe a clearer picture that might be better. Um, wireless is always popular and for those like myself who do navigation and such, the wireless is always popular if you can get, get that. Uh, that, would be, that, that would be great. Um, the surgeons we surveyed afterwards also said the same thing. They don't do a lot of bronchoscopies other than, uh, you know, their, their, their suctions and, and their protrachs. Um, uh, and so, but they were, they were also this, of the same mindset. You're like, you know what? Some of us are actually kind of getting used to this. I think COVID-19 forced our hand a lot to get used to these these aspects. And the non the highest volume in our institution is the pulmonologists uh, who use bronchoscopy. But now others involved in this whole process now are realizing that actually it's not such a bad thing. Sahara, what was it like for you compared to what you've done them before? Yeah, so um, I, I when I was talking to Jasper about this topic, um, I told him back in the day, and I'm only four years out of fellowship, but Back in the day, basically, uh, I trained at the University of Virginia. It was fellow's job to get a bronchard, so, uh, the bronchard ready and, of course, do the procedure with the attending present. So this could be your 35th hour being awake. Uh, so now you have to argue with your co-fellow that, hey, no, I need the bronchoscope bronchard first because it was one. And then you have to go down all the way to the basement to get a bronchoscope which is being shared with multiple ICUs. So normal ICU, surgical ICU, which all of us started hiding our scopes in the ICU, which was not safe, as uh, Jasper mentioned, you know, so, because it has to be fully uh, straight down how it needs to be stored. 
Um, and then you have to actually, we used to make these stasher bags for bronchoscopy. So how many pieces, if you remember just while with the bronchoscope, you have to attach, you have to attach suction, you have to attach, you know, different parts. And it, it's a learning curve how to appropriately attach them. So we used to make these stasher bags in our fellows room and write our names on it. That this is my, you know, uh, my need for the cart. So, um, so it was not a fun time. So now I joke that kids have it easy and that there is a disposable bronchoscope available in the ICU, which takes away, you know, really need to do uh, argue with different ICUs to make sure you have a scope available. Um, and anybody can grab it and give it to me and I can do a, a bronch myself also. And the real state that you need in the room is you have so much more open space now instead of a cart taking up a huge spot, um, you know, it's a pretty portable. Um, and I would like to echo actually uh, the dislikes comment, the suction quality um, on the scopes that we have currently is not the best. Um, uh, some of the suctions don't attach 100%, so we end up taping it. Um, and if I really need to dig in and pull out a bunch of mucus plugs, or actually as the study in Singapore said, if you have somebody with hemoptysis and you really need a good quality, picture quality and good suction quality, I do end up going for you know, a conventional bronchoscope. Uh, but yeah, pretty interesting experience just over the past few years. Yeah, so as we got more comfortable, I hope we, we sort of come back and sort of said, well, you know what, we've gotten used to it, but is it, is it going to be able to sort of, our disposal bronchoscope is going to get us to the next level um, of where we use them routinely um, outside of a pandemic, outside of sort of just a bedside ICU simple bronchoscope um, need. And this is where I think where the innovation part comes in, actually. And this is where I was going to be pretty fascinated because I'm actually um, Im impressed with how much sort of the uh, variety and innovation that's happening in this space. So, for example, the initial ambuscopes, which we talked about, had a 3.8 millimeter outer diameter, but a 1.2 millimeter working channel. And so you really can't get a lot of suction, you can't get a lot of utility out of a small working channel. And so when the, you know, when the ER docs or who are doing advanced airways or the laryng or the laryngoscopists sort of tell me that they're, or the anesthesiology team tell me they're using a bronchoscopic innovation and they're using these tiny scopes to do that, I kind of, you know, I'm like what are you gonna do with that? You can't, you can't suck out blood, you can't suck out mucus as much, you, you really can't do a lot. Um, but that being said now, some of these sort of newer scopes, the next generation of disposables are actually having 2.2, 2.8, 3.0 millimeter working channels. To give you an idea, to reference actually, think about the regular bronchoscopes that we have the 2.0 and even the robotics, the 2.1 millimeter working channels, you sort of start thinking about relatively, or the large working channel, you can do retrieval devices, therapeutics, you can do a lot more um, with these bronchoscopes than perhaps in this next generation as we come along. So now we're seeing a true change from not just simple airway management and simply finding the airway, finding the vocal cords and getting a tube in, to now much more advanced ideas. And we've established this in the ICU world now as almost standard now for a lot of us actually, where this is actually becoming the bronchoscope of choice for a lot of us. The disposal bronchoscope now in most ICUs that I know has is now becoming with the pandemic, the, the bronchoscope the bronchoscope of choice for a lot of a lot of hospitals and units and even some 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 uh, um, bronchoscopists as well. But now you take that to sort of the endoscopy, bronchoscopy suite or the operating room, depending on where you're doing your most or complicated procedures, and you start to see a, a potential opportunity here. And so what is that what else is happening in this in this in this space? Well, the engineering is a little bit different and allows some additional options. And I think some of the complaints we've had over the years are are potentially being addressed. Um, the idea that we've we've already established quick connections. Um, the swivel features on some of these scopes. So this idea that the scope can swivel to allow a more of a change of the view as just by turning the head is a, is now coming on coming on in some of these scopes. Better suction capabilities coming on the pipeline as well. That's actually already been in, included in some of these. The idea of an endotracheal tube retainer. So when you're doing a fiber optic bronchoscopy for intubation, a fiber, fiber optic innovation actually, that you can actually put the park the endotracheal tube at the distal end and basic at, at, at the end of the at the end of the head. And basically, once you get in the airway, advance it forward and then take off the head, and you actually can pull your and, and actually and actually you'll be uh, in a much better shape. It's a very comfortable uh, piece of equipment. I've tried it in the sim lab. I've not tried that on a patient yet. Um, heard some variable uh, 
um, feedback on that, but the concept seems sound to me. I think the minor um, things that need to be adjusted will probably, will probably be adjusted over time. And the idea of a wide range of articulation, I mean, you should see the pictures on the websites of some of these companies, actually. If you get a chance, check out their websites, and we'll talk about them a little bit. I'm not going to show them all because there's just way too many features and a lot of commercial ads out there. But the idea of being able to flex that scope a fair amount, over 200 degrees, almost on a lot of these next generation flexible bronchos, sorry, um, disposable bronchoscopes, is actually very intriguing and very, very, and very um, exciting in terms of getting to different parts of the airway. Now, some of them stiffness can be added, so they're actually talking about some of these scopes now being having a, de a decent spine. So I do a lot of video pleuroscopy or I might have a, a diff difficult airway where I may want something much more stiff and not so flexible. And so now you can see where you might have a, something on the shelf that's disposable that you can just rip out of a bag and say it's got a decent spine to it. I can tell you if, if trying to get a pleural video scope across different ICUs, different ORs is a nightmare for me. I may be see a point where I can, that, that may become my, 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 my option of choice. Um, a lock to hold the position, so you're not holding your thumb down forever or flexing forward uh, or backwards, or extending, I should say, um, that there's a lock there, that this little lever actually can maybe at one point lock on some of the new scopes coming down. And the tools might change, and I think that's something to think about. I didn't even know that there was a little microbiological holder here for specimen container actually on this Ambule scope. And I was kind of like, well, I used to ha be frustrated with some of the BAL returns that I would get, or it would just kind of get leak across the entire entire head. And I think there's some solutions coming out of the pipeline now that are fairly interesting. So what are your thoughts on this? Absolutely. I think um, just maneuvering improvement would help uh, make, to make its way from ICU into our Bronx suites um, inpatient or outpatient for pulmonary world. Because uh, I still enjoy um, a conventional bronchoscope. I feel like it easily get me into uh, difficult sub-segments and uh, maneuvering would help. Um, because uh, it's just much nicer. Uh, second thing, I completely agree with you. I have lost uh, BL if I'm doing some of the positioning uh, of where you're getting the suction, because I have to pull the suction off to get some of the BLs, even though I'm not pushing on it. Uh, I think this new device will definitely help with that or some other changes like, uh, that will definitely evolve as, as our needs evolve. And once again, I want to point out, it's only been in use for really a few years. So the more we uh, you know, give feedback, the better things can come um, on the market. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Now, I have to say, there's something I'm really worried about, the waste pattern. It's just, it, mm -hmm. it almost breaks my heart throwing a whole bronchoscope in the trash. You know, I just, it's just something about, it's very uneasy feeling to me, sort of how much waste a bronchoscopy can generate. And as I guess it was pointed out to me several years ago though, well, think about all the waste of all the cleaning agents. Think of all those aspects of how much water waste, cleaning agent waste, and sort of the toxic materials that you're doing just to clean things. And I think that's going to get even more, reg as that gets more regulated and more agents get added to clean it. Think about, I mean, right now with, with COVID, we cleaned everything, right? Every surface, everything we touched and all these things. And now you're talking about, you know, invasive devices and having to clean them and ensure that not just viral transmission, but also all these multi-drug resistance organisms and all the fear of this is going to get increasingly regulated. I mean, those are going to be create a lot more biohazards potentially in the environment for other reasons. So thinking about balancing them, I don't have a real a lot of data here to show you. The manufacturers heard that feedback and then some of them have come up with, with um, recycling programs. So I um, have to start thinking about that. Well, where else have we seen this? Well, we've seen this also in the airway piece, right? We went from a direct laryngoscopy with a blade that you would put, put in, the, in the cleaning place or with chest tubes where we basically went with, you know, a whole chest tube tray, which only one tenth of it is useful in that in any patient. And now we have these kits that sort of open and you, and you throw them out afterwards. And so I think um, we've reconciled waste in other areas such as disposable um, bron uh, um, diagnostic instruments as well. So we've adjusted to some of these, but throwing a whole bronchoscope away still seems like a lot of, a lot of, a lot of waste, but yet I think there's a competing is issues as well. So we'll have to see how that looks. And I'm very interested to see and learn more about the recycling pieces and see is the, how are these truly being recycled? And the other part, so the other turbine I wear is the administrative turbine part of this, and sort of saying where, you know, well, it's not just about me. I have to be cognizant of, you know, direct costs. I can look at sort of a flexible bronchoscope and say, that's pretty expensive per bronchoscope. 
But then I got to think about also the indirect costs, and then many of them are hit, are hidden. You know, the cost of storage, the cost of transport, the cost of RTs or or other nursing or other staff that are helping you in the background, getting making sure your your reusable scopes are properly administered and functioning. The the costs of a warranty program, for example, the, could be substantial depending on what service contract you have. Um, waste. We talked about waste, but also the location, and that's a key one for me. I don't. I work at several different hospitals, but I also work uh, sort of trying to get my other colleagues, other hospitals, up to speed. And so when I do that, I need to make sure that you know what they don't always have the skilled respiratory therapists that I have, or the um, the people at the bedside who really know what, who really have all those hands on. And so I have to be cognizant that you know what they may be doing a bronchoscope in a place that hardly ever does more than one a week or so. Think about portability, what staff they're help they're going to have, and all those aspects. So think about location a lot. And so I think about that a lot, and I wonder, well, if I can sacrifice a little bit of functionality to get the convenience offset of location convenience, recognizing that aspect, that's important. And the regulatory aspects, we talked about the JCO, the warranties, the contracts, site inspections, all that stuff is going to escalate as this whole field is going, moving that way. And it's not just in bronchoscopy. But there's market trends here, or industry trends, I should say, rather, where a lot of things are going into, from, from reusable, even we used to do reusable ET tubes, and now we're doing single-use tubes, biopsy forceps from, from, from reusable to single, single use. Guess what? Other industries, um, ureteroscopes now, pretty, pretty much a lot of, in, in our institution, they're almost all dispo done by disposable, by disposable scopes now. So start thinking about duodenoscopes. I mean, now that I think about it, I share my Bronx suite with the GI team, and they're doing five times the volume that, that the pulmonary team is doing because they're just their their growth has been very explosive, and explosive in the GI world can be kind of gross too. So you think about what's circulating in our Bronx suite and the cleaning areas and all those bugs and stuff like that. You start thinking about well, is this the direction we're going to go regardless? And the mar and that's that's not lost on industry. So the global and disposable endoscopy market actually is actually changing quite a bit. And so even though North America is still projected to be a leader, a lot of the rest of the world is kind of starting to really recognize that, hey, by the way, we can also do bronchoscopy. We don't have the sophisticated cleaning agents and the processes and all these other things involved. We may get by with just using single-use bronchoscopes or endoscopes of other, kind, of other types. And so and across the industry from GI, urology, ENT, arthroscopy, or orthopedics, you're seeing the endoscopy market changing quite a bit. And in bronchoscopy, actually, there are several key players with all kinds of innovations. From Varathon, we heard about Glidoscope. Uh, Olympus now has has uh, has taken over Varon, uh, which would be interesting uh, in the, how it affects our bronchoscopy industry. Boston Scientific has some promising uh, technologies that are coming out. It's, it's impressive what they're offering. And Amboost is a market leader in the space currently. But keep your eye on this market. And then encouraged to contact your local representatives. I mean, one of the feedback I got in our survey was that some people felt that you know we're getting pushed too much to go this way. That the that the device manufacturers are a little bit pushy and such. And I'll say honestly, take just take a look what they're what they're what they're what they're offering. And I think we're going to try to feature some of them on our our advanced bronchoscopy summer summit through the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy. But I think this stuff is really interesting and in where this market's going. Sahar, would you agree? No, absolutely. And actually, when I looked at uh, that the graph on the previous slide, um, when we were researching this topic, it, I was pretty blown away that in my narrow view, it was only for bronchoscopy and airway and intubations and tracheostomy. And then when you said, oh, did you see this trend like in every field? And I started looking into it. That was pretty fascinating that everybody is going in that direction anyways, even before COVID. And now COVID has just brought it all to the attention and made it so much easier. So it's not just you know our uh, area that is evolving like this and we have to evolve with it but also everybody's paying attention to that uh, which makes it you know which makes complete sense yeah so ultimately though the last slide will this change my practice and so i think it will depending on as i'm it may not happen in the endoscopy unit immediately um, but at least from thinking now i'm approaching bronchoscopy as i start thinking about our large health system that we work in all the different sites in which I work, for example, and all the people involved in making a bronchoscopy and venture successful, I start thinking about very carefully is um, what type of equipment I need for my, that, will fill my, that will fulfill my clinical needs of the problem at hand. If it's a simple problem versus a more complex problem, 
for example, um, like a you know cryo or something that might damage the scope, I'm going to have to think about things a little bit differently. What physical resources do I have? Do I have that equipment handy? So when I go to the operating room, it happened the other day, I went to the operating room to do a bronchoscope, to, 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 to do a bronchoscopy, and they don't have certain things. And so I was like, well, you know what? Maybe just keep a small, less, less intrusive in terms of storage space, a couple of scopes I need that would immediately fit the need that might be an option. Um, cleaning aspects, and so we talked about that a, a fair amount. Then the human resources. What Now we might talk about what team you have, but also yourself. Like It's so frustrating to sometimes not have what you need at the point of care. And so sometimes you have to sort of recognize that, you know what, it's frustrating when things are, are, are very challenging to get the thing that you need done. And the equipment may have an issue, the personnel may not be right, and you start realizing that, you know what, it's far less stressful for me to just have a disposable bronchoscope available when I need it, wherever I go. And so that's something to think about um, in this space now. And then the administration piece, what do the operations look like to make things happen? And what does a market look like? And I think if I start putting this in this context, I start asking myself, will diagnostic bronchoscopy actually come to, well, sorry, will flexible bronchoscopy uh, that's disposable come to my bronchoscopy suite? And I don't see why I wouldn't start trying. The other thing we didn't mention was the displays are changing as well. The, and one of the new innovations now is some of the display devices now are, are adapting quite a bit where they may even be able to interface with your current towers as well to sort of see how they, how, how they fit in. So just experiment, start inquiring. And I think, you, I think you might be surprised like I was in preparing for this talk and started as I adjust my practice in the past year. And as we sort of said, a lot of innovations in these scopes, uh, much to learn. And if you have ideas or didn't like things that we said or thought it was too um, sort of biased in one way, please let us know. We're just trying to learn in this space with many of you because um, ultimately we wanna make things better for our patients, our communities, our teams. And, uh, and so um, on, the, on the one year anniversary of the WHO pandemic, We've learned, we've come a long way in the space and I, we don't wanna see a good crisis go to waste. So we wanna make sure that we learn the most, the most that we can um, out of this and advance, and advance in this way. So Har, anything else to ask? No, absolutely. I think, um, of course, uh, I don't have the admin perspective, but uh, searching for this topic really helped you know, bring it to perspective. For me, the most important has always been, are my patients safe um, from, uh, me deciding to bronch to bronch somebody just because if I don't have the tower available, um, or if I'm spreading infection to them while I'm trying to save them, and also again the human perspective of uh, me and my uh, my team. Uh, I'm in charge of my team. I as much as I can minimize a risk to them and them being in the room with me when I'm doing this procedure. I think that will definitely help. Um, so as as we said. A lot of bad things have come with the pandemic, but a lot of good has happened to in learning in many spaces. Uh, so this could be a learning teamwork better just by uh, you know, seeing who's in the room with you when you're performing procedures. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for taking the time to, to bear with us. And I hope you enjoyed today, today's uh, webinar by the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy. I'm, again, I'm Jaspal Singh. I'm with Sahar Mansoor. Uh, feel free to contact us, email us. Um, tweet, whatever it is that floats your boat, and reach out to us with any questions. We'll take some questions right now. Um, Gus, you still there? I am always here, Jasper. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I didn't know that there was so much to know about disposable bronchoscope, so it was very humbling for me to hear the wealth of uh, knowledge that you both share with our audience. Um, I have a couple of questions um, uh, that, uh, to me, uh, as an interventional pulmonologist, uh, is important. One of the uses that uh, I have for disposable bronchoscopes is when I'm doing rigid bronchoscopy. Um, it's not the same to, um, you know, scrape a little bit the outer sheath of the of a $10,000, uh, you know, reusable bronchoscope than, you know, a $300 one. Um, what is the largest uh, working channel and the best quality that you feel that it's out there? We are brand agnostic at the society, but the quality of the image sometimes is lacking on these disposables and where it matters the most is to see. So where would you say that we start exploring for interventional pomology, the, the use of disposable bronchoscopes with the largest working channel possible? I, I'm almost ready there. I'm already. I'm almost there, Gus. I mean, I'm not. I don't do rigids, but to be honest with you, with a three millimeter working channel now, and a, and at least a two point eight on some of these, and then the displays now, they're going to be interfacing with our towers with a simple cable connection. I mean, I'm coming to the point where um, I don't see why we wouldn't. I mean, is the scope isn't the visualization isn't the key, right? It's usually the intervention. 
right? Whether it be some type of either biopsy or ablation or something else, you're gonna fix something, right? Or deposit a valve or some other device or stent. And so if you can accomplish that with a scope that gets it, the, the, the focus isn't the scope, the focus is solving the clinical problem. So I don't see why I wouldn't start thinking of the space, especially as I start thinking about, we have in our institution capacity issues, right? You have one Bronx suite, you have a bunch of procedures to do, and not every patient can come to you at every single time, or they can't get done at the proper time, or they need to go to the OR. And it may be a different OR room or a different OR team. I mean, it's just frustrating to micromanage every aspect of a big tower. But if I can get to where I need to go and solve the problem I need and just take it in a little suitcase, basically, um, in a little bag or on my backpack or whatever the case might be, I'm gonna start doing that. I do the same thing already with my portable ultrasound. I basically take that everywhere um, for my plural cases. So I see this kind of becoming a, a huge, um, almost like a portable backpack type of thing for the interventional pulmonologist. Am I wrong in that or what do you think? Well, uh, to me, I mean, I, um, I use essentially disposable bronchoscopes for mainly three um, situations. One is whenever we're doing a tracheostomy and either I'm doing the trach or I'm doing the airway, we don't want any needles near a no, $10,000 bronchoscope. Um, Second is um, when we are doing a rigid bronchoscopy, we, we degloved a couple of, uh, uh, you know, $10,000 bronchoscopes on, on whenever the case got rough. So therefore administration started asking questions, you know, can you use a disposal and, you know, um, for a value proposal. And the third is exactly what uh, Sahar was, was, was mentioning. There's somebody that needs a BAL, just, just bring the towel, just don't bring the tower, bring the disposal just in and out and it's very convenient. I think that there's a larger market and as we find uh, more opportunities, I would love to have a little bit more forgiving working channel. Sometimes it gets clunky, sometimes it gets stuck. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it feels a little a little flimsy, the, the, the bronchoscope. I mean, we're used to having these industrial strength, very responsive uh, handles. And right now, the plastic thing for me is relearning sometimes how to be a little more gentle, otherwise I'm gonna end up uh, you know, destroying the scope. Um, and then the vision, I like I like clarity, I like HD, but I think that, as I agree with you, that's not what's at stake. The, at stake is what, uh, what the, the functionality of the bronchoscope to get the job at, um, done. So I, I am with you that I think it's going in that direction. I have one last question for both of you, and um, this is uh, from Deepak. He's asking, what percentage of hospital which use disposable uh, bronch, uh, so uh, can you essentially recycle a disposable scope? I, I think I know the answer, but again, let's 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 answer this with an open mind. So, how do you want that one? So, uh, sorry, uh, the connection was poor. So, how much of those scopes can you recycle? Is that was uh, the question? Can there, can if there's any way or any 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 you know for for you know maybe uh, underserved areas or maybe in situations that uh, you need to reuse disposable scopes, is there a mechanism? Uh, is there no, a way that actually. Not that I'm aware of, and uh, in late 1990s, early 2001, I saw some FDA reports of how to reuse some of the disposable scopes. Um, but with all the uh, outbreak of infections we've had, uh, it really is not safe uh, to reuse uh, disposable scopes. Yeah, it's, it's not even approved for the FDA, uh, so I don't know if they'd be kosher to even sort of have that conversation, to be honest with you. But that being said, um, the recycling programs are, are changing and adapting, so I don't know about enough about that, to be honest. To be honest. Um, and how about I have to get back to you about that? I just don't know enough about the recycling features of what actually happens on the recycling end. We're told they get recycled. I think most of it is for materials, from what I understand, talking to the, rep, the reps so far, from what I've learned. But I could be wrong on that, and there might be some more creative ways. But I think it's a, these are creative questions. I just don't have enough information. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that the, the question may have been twofold. You know, if you can, if you can reuse, or um, I think that I'm. What maybe Deepak was trying to ask is, we had, um, we all had situations in which a patient was bleeding or a patient had whatever. In my institution, we do not leave the um, disposal scope hanging in the room. Usually, we use it and we pitch it. Do you have any advice for those that say, you know, um, leave the scope hanging once it has been used in the sheath, or you know, use and throw away? No, that's the whole. The whole value proposition is partly predicated on infection transmission risk, so we just throw it away. Just like we do it with a, with a forceps or a brush or a needle or whatever you use, you're throwing it away after you're done. Okay, I think that the message is heard loud and clear. One single use, in and out, um, throw it away, don't try to re, no, recycle, don't try to 
do anything. But uh, one last question, and I promise this is the last one, and we have some uh, active audience here. Um, so, okay, so the question is, can we use cryo tools through disposable bronchoscopes? I think we know the answer, but go, take, take a stab at it. Yep, I would say yes. I mean, obviously, it depends on the working channel, what scope you have, obviously, but I think it's being done already in some places. I'd be curious of those. I don't do cryo, so I know some people I know who do do cryo, um, and they've told me that they do it. Um, just a little bit of a learning curve, I've been told, but I don't, um, I've been told that you can do it. Well, I think that the disposable era is here to stay. Um, we have uh, both um, platforms for cryo, the reusable cryo probes, the 1.9, 2.4. We have the disposable cryo probes, which has the 1.1, 1.9, and 2.2. And I think that if we need to do some extraction and we need to do it, I do not see any problem to thread cryo probes through a disposable scope whatsoever. Uh, but again, I think that this is a topic that we will definitely talk more in the upcoming months. Uh, there's very exciting things coming up um i really want to appreciate the time that both of you took i think that it has been very enlightening particularly for me and the audience we have um nothing but a words of appreciation for uh for uh, the society that uh, sponsors in our audience we have um exciting things coming we have our virtual national conference for the society coming up on june the 12th and we will be making announcements very very soon um, and stay tuned in our social media. Uh, we have um, dates coming up uh, about very, very, very interesting topics. So, um, Jasper, uh, do you feel that um, you as the treasurer, do you have any closing remarks or uh, maybe Dr. Mansour? No, I just want to say thanks. And thanks to thanks to Emily, the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy, Gus, your whole team. You guys did a great job getting us to this point. And Sahar, always fun working with you again on this type of thing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. This will conclude our webinar for today. This uh, recording will be made available on the Society website. And if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to contact. And remember, signing up to get access to all of these resources. Become a member and help us get stronger. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you.